Al Gore used the example of the disappearing glaciers on Mount Kilimanjaro. Well, actually, <laughs> that's not caused by global warming. It's caused by a drying effect. <laughs> so he's, he generally got it right, but he used the wrong mountain. And here's some of the evidence. You know, practically all glaciers in the world have slowly decreased since 1880, about 1880. And this I showed you earlier in my Ice Age talk. This is the Athabasca Glacier in the Canadian Rockies. And why was it out there at 1890? Well, because all the glaciers in the world advanced at one time during the, what's called the Little Ice Age. Between 1400 and about 1880, they all advanced. There's some, there's some funny stories about this. In the Swiss Alps, the glaciers were coming out during the Little Ice Age. And they'd get priests up there to try to... Uh, do something to stop it and it wouldn't work so it'd come into the village and overcome some of their houses and farms so. and the polar the the sea uh, ice on the arctic has decreased you can see the numbers right in here since so about 1970 and it really went down in 2007 and this is the picture at the minimum in september of 2007 now I must give you some more information about this. First of all, there was a circulation, average circulation, that caused the flow to go twice as fast out into the North Atlantic from the Arctic Ocean that decreased the sea ice. So the, the circulation caused a decrease. That was partly why it decreased so much. And secondly, they haven't told you, probably haven't heard this, I'll, to, I'll ask and see. In the last two years, it has increased about 25%. Have you heard that? Okay. And you know why? We're having global cooling at the moment, since 2002. <laughs> so it, there's more to the story, you can, you can tell that. But it isn't, it, the fact that it was way up here used to only melt just along the nor, north shore of, of Alaska and Siberia and it's been slowly melting back, is a sign of global warming. And the permafrost is, uh, is melting somewhat too, but there's more to that story too. But, uh, so there are signs, but it's, uh, and for a while Greenland glaciers were moving at a rapid rate. Now, getting back to the, the claim 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit war, uh, warming, Robert Balling is a professor of meteorology at I think it's Arizona State University. And he's probably the top expert on the problems with these temperature measurements, which I'm familiar with too. Every time you move, you know, one of those white boxes where you have instruments in it, uh, you, you know, they've had to move these stations. And when you move them, you, go, you move into a different microclimate. Now farmers are familiar with that. You know, in different places in your fields, you know, have a different temperature, different humidity. So that when you move a station, you change, it changes. Also, when you change instruments, Sometimes those instruments uh, don't measure the same way as the old ones, so you have a bias in, in those records. So these records are full of errors. Uh, some stations they only measure once a day, and if the guy decides he wants to, instead of uh, reading at 4 p.m., he reads it at 4 a.m., that changes, changes the, the, uh, it. The, the, the highs and lows are different. So Robert Bowling has is, is, uh, looked at a lot of this stuff, uh, and, he, and he thinks you can whittle off 0.2 to 0.6 degrees centigrade from that 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit, of which essentially that's about zero, let's say it's 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So essentially about one third of the warming probably is due to systematic biases towards warming. So our real warming maybe is around 0.8 degrees Fahrenheit, not near as what they say. But climate gate, which you're probably all familiar with, probably tells us Maybe we could even will off more than what Robert Balling says. Why? It's showing us that there was a, probably a lot of bias towards warming when they, they did these global temperature averages. And ClimateGate shows critics have been suppressed. And they didn't get a chance to, to uh, say, hey, no, that's not quite right. And then we found out that when, when uh, skeptics have asked for their raw data, they weren't, it wasn't given to them, and this was illegal, but they're not getting prosecuted for some reason. And so there's been a suppression of data, and finally when they had to reveal their data, they found out all the data from China has been, is missing. So there's a call now to redo all these figures, and I think that should be done. We need to redo it, because I think we can whittle off more than Robert Balling says. 
He says we can whittle off maybe a third of that. Maybe we can add another uh, few tenths of a degree to where maybe global warming is only 0 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit so far. So what am I saying? I'm saying that global warming is really small, and there, the claim is probably exaggerated. Also, we've had some, you know, a lot of anomalies uh, lately. We've had huge snowstorms with this global warming. And the, uh, two years ago, the amount of sea ice around Antarctica set an all-time record. So, you know, there's, there's a, this is in the southern hemisphere, of course, where there hasn't been any global warming. So, and also the urban heat island effect. Now, I at once thought that they had taken most of that out because they have uh, done a lot of um, uh, smoothing of this. But I found out through Climate Gate and other things that they probably have not taken out all of it. And I don't think that the reason is, is be, uh, like as a city grows larger, more concrete absorbs uh, solar radiation and it stays warmer at night and so forth. Like Phoenix has warmed six degrees in the last hundred years inside the city. And in fact, I, there, I believe uh, Albuquerque has an uh, urban heat island effect. When we were out in the country, it was 76 degrees coming in um, Friday. And when we got in the city, it got up to 82. I mean, we didn't change elevations or nothing. So. Uh, that's showing that there's an urban heat island effect. But I believe they've ignored the urban heat island effect for cities of less than 100,000 population. But if you look at these curves, over the years there has been a slight global warming in those, those. So that would be a bias in the temperature records if they ignored this. They've probably taken out these effects of the bigger cities. So these errors are in there. Also, I told you about the changing of instruments. I've seen this myself when they've done this. Uh, even, even, even the precipitation measurements, they change the gauge and they don't catch all the precipitation. I think that's a problem we have in, in uh, the new instruments in Montana that's caused, uh, they said there's been a drought for 10 years. I, I think they're only half right. I think the new instruments care, have caught less snow. But here's an here's instrument. They changed the instrument to HO63. And uh, this is the average before they change it for 40 months. This is the average after. So it made a change about uh, four tenths of a degree centigrade. <laughs> so with all these errors, there's lots of problems. So that's why I'm saying this 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit is exaggerated. And of course, a lot of instruments are positioned wrong. They're supposed to be over a, a grassy area with no buildings or around it. <laughs> Look at this one. This is the official station at Hopkinsville, Kentucky. This is verified by Roger Pelkey. He's a climatologist for, I think it's Colorado State University. And look at that. You, you never put a, a thermometer right on pavement and, uh, right? And, and if you, if you, if you, if you <laughs> the grill. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they moved the grill. Come on. <laughs> And uh, there's a report out, and I haven't verified this, that a lot of stations that are, go into the climate records are poorly positioned. I have to look into that a little more. And another, another little uh, problem is the, the rural areas, which are, are the cooler areas, they have, the number of stations have decreased over the years. I think most of these are in Russia. After the, uh, the communism collapsed, you know, most of the rural, a lot of the rural stations were closed. And when you close them, you still have all these, these urban and suburban stations, which causes, will cause a bias towards warming. And here's the weather balloon, which you can't see very well. It's that white line, but it's very parallel to the satellite observation. See, they've been measuring the temperature of the atmosphere since 1979. And the guys who've been doing this are skeptics of global warming. Uh, a guy named uh, John Christie has been in charge of that. And Roy Spencer, Roy Spencer just wrote a book just recently that's very provocative. Um, they've been in charge of the satellite program at the University of Al Alabama, I think it is. And anyway, the satellites at first when they came in showed a, a global cooling. But there are errors in the satellite data, and they've corrected those errors, where the atmosphere now shows only a slight global warming since instruments came in uh, since 1979. Well, the surface is claimed to be a lot more. Well, now if there's lots of errors in there we're finding, you know, the satellite, which measures the whole atmosphere, may be more correct now. See, there is a difference between the surface measurements and the atmosphere, but you'd expect them to be generally close. 
So, and I, I trust the satellite measurements a lot more than I would uh, all these surface measurements. So, I think that what we're finding is that now, including these errors, we're finding out that uh, this, uh, they're probably close, but it, the satellite one and the weather balloon curve, which is this one, is probably more correct, which only shows a slight bit of warming. But that's not all. I'm just talking to you about the bulk warming. I haven't told you uh, who's responsible yet. So the fourth thing, there are natural cycles of climate change, mainly volcanism, which I talked about in Ice Age, that'll cause a cooling, El Nino, which causes a warming. And by the way, we're in an El Nino cycle now. So I wouldn't be surprised to see, when we see the global temperature average, that we see a little spike going up. And the sun, which causes long-term changes. And we can measure these changes by the number of sunspots. For instance, now sunspots are cool spots. And you'd think that would, uh, the more the sunspots uh, and the cooler the sun, the less the solar radiation the, uh, and the cooler it would be on Earth. But it's the opposite. The more the sunspots has been correlated with warmer temperatures. Why? Because sunspots are more than made up by hot spots called faculae. So here's the sunspots, they're the cool spots, that's where they're dark. The hot spots are white, and uh, they, go in, they come in tandem. So, and you have an 11-year cycle, you have a 22-year cycle in sunspot, and a 100-year cycle, and I think you have a 200-year cycle. And there's a lot of variability in, in this. And by the way, the, the recent global cooling we've had is correlated with a decrease in sunspots. And I believe that the sunspot cycle hasn't really started up again, and it should have started up a year ago. We also know from historical records and also tree ring data, you got to analyze these tree rings correctly because tree rings have a lot of errors in them and usually want the short uh, period uh, for, for climate fluctuations. And you really, for this type of work, you want the long period. So you got to reanalyze all that data. And this was done in the journal of Climate 2008. And this is what he got. He got the little ice age, and, we're, and this is degrees centigrade about only minus 0 0.45 degrees, you know, lots of fluctuations in there. We had a lot of volcanism during this time, too. We had uh, uh, Tambora going off in 1815, one of the largest historical uh, eruptions in, that we know of. And before that, we had the medieval warm period, about uh, centered around 900 AD. This was the time the Vikings settled southwest Greenland. And then they disappeared uh, during the Little Ice Age, because, probably because the glaciers came out and covered their farms. Me and another guy uh, from Great Falls, Montana, Peter Kleberg, are doing a big study on the Little Ice Age, but we include the medieval warm period. And he's been to Iceland and Norway uh, doing the study. And he's found out that the farms of the Vikings, uh, due to the recent global warming, which you don't see right in here, uh, are actually still being exposed as the glaciers are retreating on southwest Greenland, which tells you that when they first got there, that it was probably warmer than today during the medieval warm period. In fact, they were able to grow grapes in England, and lots of uh, trees grew a lot further north during this period. So we have lots of historical data on this. Same with this period. The Thames River in England froze over many times during this period. And this was a period uh, centered about 1700, where on the sun, we had a period of 70 years where we had hardly any sunspots. I think only 50 sunspots were counted in a 70-year period. It's called the Maunder Minimum, when we should have 50,000. And so this is all correlated to the sun, effects of the sun. So we have these natural cycles of the sun in the, in the, in the, temp, in the global temperature records. Let's just focus it in on the last 140 years and see which record is more correlated with uh, the temperature record. The blue is the temperature record. It was fluctuating around, in, but it, nothing really happened until 1910 and then shot up. And that's the time when we had the Dust Bowl era in the Midwest in, in there. And then it peaked about, oh, World War II, and then we had this global cooling <laughs> to about 1970s. And then it's been global warming since. 